Yeah, what I really like about pre-search right now is I would wake up and then be done and all I would do was that. Like none of the stuff I'm doing right now, it's important, but it's not important to today. I cannot work today. If you said, hey Ryan, let's do a 16 hour call, I'd have the time for it. It wasn't always that way. I didn't have the time for it, say two years ago. Two years ago, I'd be like, man, if I don't work for a day, I'm kind of screwed. I, I'm too valuable as an employee. So then it came down to like restructuring, getting the employees that I trusted to where I could do that. Exit Plan is a podcast for business owners and those who want to be business owners. I'm always in search of the lesser known stories of entrepreneurship. In the Exit Plan podcast, you'll hear stories from startup to sale and hear from the professionals who helped business owners achieve their exit. Hosted by me, author and private equity manager, Dana Robinson, along with my co-hosts and guests, you'll hear real stories, tips, and tools that will help you plan for the exit you want, whether you are still working at a day job or running a business. Let's get started with this episode of the Exit Plan Podcast. Hey, everybody, it's Dana Robinson coming to you with the Exit Plan Podcast and a longtime friend, colleague, uh, Ryan Sandberg. Ryan, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> so uh, mo most people that are that are following the podcast at this point are old uh, fans of Nate and Dana. Uh, when we had the opt out podcast. So uh, I, I dare say that a number of people listening remember my podcast partner, Nate, who has chosen to only podcast with me when he really feels like it, uh, partly because he has boys who play baseball that are so good at the sport that they got promoted to a league called 365. And do you know, Ryan, what, what baseball 365 is? I, I don't, but that's because I have daughters and I'm trying to stay away from that. <laughs> it's every day. That's it. They call it yeah. 365 because there's 365 days. And apparently that's how much they play baseball. Uh, so uh, Nate is how I met you. So that's why I'm talking about Nate. Uh, I'd love to get, uh, you know, I, I know some of your story, but I don't know how, what you did before you landed at Nate's first company and, and what happened through that journey and, and how you ended up being the entrepreneur you are today. So uh, talk me through the, the early uh, entrepreneurial journey for you. Yeah. So what I did before is kind of what led me into working with Nate. It's, it's mainly that I was working in construction. My degree is in construction from the University of Minnesota and 2010 in the Midwest was not time to do construction. So uh, looking for something else to do, found, I found Spread Effect, which was Nate's company born out of where he was working before doing links uh, yeah. on Craigslist. And <laughs> to I went and had lunch at the place beneath the office with Chris, like wore a shirt and tie, probably the last time I wore a shirt and tie. Um, <laughs> and basically he kind of talked to me about what they were doing. Um, and to me, it was completely foreign. I did not, I mean, I came from my dad's dad was a hog farmer and a pastor. Like <laughs> we didn't really have this, understanding of what entrepreneurs did other than on my mom's side of the family, there are successful entrepreneurs. So I had this sight of like, oh, they're wealthy. They go on vacation and stuff, which is not something we do. <laughs> and uh, I don't really know much beyond that. So I went into construction because my wealthiest uncle <laughs> was a design builder. And I was like, well, that is how you do it. So I'm going to do that. And then market was bad found Nate, started working with him. Yeah. He was doing SEO, long, long form SEO content, link building as an agency. And did, was that complete gibberish to you as well? I mean, did you come into this with some understanding of the technology? No idea why Google worked the way it w did. Um, other than the better companies are on top, the worst companies are beneath. Why? I don't Because Google said so. Um, <laughs> so kind of learned it all working there. I, I started out just doing um, like uh, blogger outreach and uh, new task was get more people in the database. And so 
I remember the first week I worked there, I got our emails uh, flagged for being a spam account for sending too many. And I was oh, like, you're hey, working that spam. hard. So that's that's yeah. a, a sort of a good sign, except then you've got to get a new email account, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, yeah, I worked there and just basically figured work hard enough, figure it out later. Um, and uh, took on more responsibility. Uh, visited San Diego one time and we all kind of, me and Chris and Charlie were like, okay, let's live there instead of St. Louis. San Diego has a beach, St. Louis has an arch. Um, <laughs> so we moved out there and just continued to grow it. The biggest opportunity I had in that was when Nate and them were kind of looking for something new and Danny looked at, you know, buying them and I was able to be party to that deal just by trying to make myself as invaluable as I can. Um, not so much with the goal of I'll get equity in it, but it kind of came hand in hand with, we better give this guy equity um, if we want it to do well. Yeah. And so did that for a year until we sold it again. Then it That's was like, fantastic. So I don't have a job and now I don't want a job. So what to do from there is where I ended up where I'm at now. I love that. The uh, I'll self promote for just a minute. The, the, mm -hmm. the book I just published is called The King's Fly Swatter. It's a parable, along with real stories of entrepreneurs who worked at jobs and were really ambitious and extracted relationships and skills and knowledge and learned what they didn't know they didn't know and, and, and really did these things that a lot of people think just benefit the employer. Dana Robinson here. Quick plug for my book, The King's Fly Swatter. You can see it here behind me if you're watching this. I've got it in my hand. It's a beautiful uh, hardcover book printed to make it giftable, something that you can share with a family member, buy as a gift. So this latest book, it's a fable about a person who has a really crappy job. Let's just start there. This is a book that most people can relate to because we've all had crappy jobs. This is the story of Ubar, a servant in the court of a Babylonian king who masters his boring, monotonous job and then learns to listen to the king, hearing him rule the kingdom while quietly swatting flies behind the king. Eventually, Ubar becomes the wisest and most successful man in the kingdom. The story is fun and it's easy to read, but it's not mythology. It's my story. And as I shared the idea with colleagues and friends, I learned that it was their story. And guess what? It's your story. If you're at a job of any kind, one that you love, one that you hate, one that's just enough to get by, this little book gives fresh perspective on how to leverage that job to get you something greater than a paycheck. The lessons in this parable are entrepreneurial lessons but not what you might think from the current entrepreneurial zeitgeist. If you or someone you know are looking for a real pathway to entrepreneurship, here's the secret. Your job is the way out of your job. It's counterintuitive, but once you see how it works, you can't unsee it. Learn the way of the fly swatter from the parable of Ubar and from the stories I share from my 30 year business journey. You can get a free copy of The King's Fly Swatter by going to DanaRobinson.com. And then that's how people become entrepreneurs, right? You, be, you can't become an operator by sitting around and, and waiting to do the minimum. Yeah. So, uh, and I just found, if you think of everybody we know that's an entrepreneur, they, they didn't have some crazy idea that they got funded by VCs. They learned a thing at a job and, and Nate's a good example of that. And then they go, I think I could do this. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you're almost unemployable because you you realize you can do these things, and and then you go do them. So you 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 did that, and and along the way, I mean, uh, you got a double uh, because you got to get your first kind of equity, uh, yeah, transaction, as well as all the skills, and that that's interesting because you're learning the thing that the business does but you're learning the, the, the business of the business as well. I mean, you build this thing to sell it and now you know that plus the underlying skills. Now you're a SEO expert accidentally and now an, you know, an entrepreneur knows how a business could be run and sold. Yeah, 
I, I, I was also fortunate in the, the sale of it too, because the, the thing that I didn't know to that point was the highest level of managing the business. And when we had the year together with Danny, I got some insight into that. And then post, I worked with the, the guys we sold it to for a while. And the main guy running the operations came from BCG, uh, Casey, and was extremely helpful in, not like intentionally, but teaching me the ropes of what he's doing on the higher level of business. I mean, your BCG, they're obviously doing it like Uber MBA style. But um, yeah, for me, I could see like this overall top level down. This is what they're doing. Um, insight into kind of once you know it, it's not hard. Once you're at level three, you know, level three, but it's a matter of just getting there. So uh, that was extremely helpful. It, it helped me get to then where I'm at now. Yeah, you get the why and the how at the same time. And and a lot of people are, tune, they tune out, I think. I mean, you, you probably worked with people that tuned out and they probably still have jobs while you're off running a business you own. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So well, you're, you you get an exit, uh, you, uh, you help a transition, which is always part of an exit. You're stuck with some new guys while you, you know, uh, it, try to ensure there's no hold back, claw back attrition uh that sort of thing then then you're unemployed uh what did you do after that yeah so after that the idea was i was gonna help uh nate actually look for deals with uh private equity oh that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so the let's pause i forgot about our era of of links right so uh mm-hmm. uh both Nate had a relationship, and in fact, I did too, with the principal of of Lynx in Canada. I mm-hmm. happened to have ha- I, he happened to have stayed in a guest house I rented at the, at one point, and um, and Nate and Brandon came across him, and yeah. between yeah. them and Nate and Brandon's contacts in Missouri, they they were trying to find bird dog deals for basically a private equity acquisition, right? Yeah. And so I forgot you were involved with that. So you jumped, you, you threw your hat in the ring with that for a while. So so there was an interesting point where I could have gone one or two ways that I was interested in with that. One was I was, ex- I didn't really know what I was doing in that world. I was able to, at that time, see some deal memos that, you know, the links guys shared with me and stuff like that and see kind of how they operated to have this look at what's the end of a business what makes them attractive to buy and what makes other ones not attractive to buy i was fortunate where they let me go meet with some business owners and interview them and qualify or disqualify them so it helps me right now understand if at some like the businesses you want to buy are good businesses so set yourself as a business that someone wants to buy whether or not you want to sell it's a good way to if i don't know what i want to do i at least should work towards that because that's a good place to be. Um, one, there was two guys that I talked to at that time that were fairly important. One was the guy that owned Presearch, which is the company I ended up buying myself. The other one was this guy named Stan Sedgwick, who is at WD40, and he wrote a book about getting out of entrepreneurship into corporate. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I kind of looked at that as like, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should look at that. Maybe there's something to there's some happiness in that. Um, and he, I ended up doing a number of calls with him. He was really helpful. He was really insightful. Um, he made it sound cool, but was he the founder of WD 40? I mean, I, I, I've heard the name. He was, he was, he was a high level VP there. He had some other entrepreneurship endeavors that he did well at, you know, he was easy to go straight to the top at a not small company, you know, major, you know, worldwide company. But in any case, I, I saw that as like, a, oh, this is seems cool. <laughs> um, you're wealthy. <laughs> you know, all, all of it's always a little bit like, look at the rich guy. How do I get there? Um, but uh, I had reached out to the company back home in my hometown. They were way too small for links, like beyond too small and forgot about them for probably six months till they reached out to me like, hey, this probably isn't going to work out. Um, do you want to come work with us, get some sweat equity, you know, and help us, you know, get out of where we are. And so that's how I got involved with it. 
That's fantastic. Yeah. So right. the, the, the pre pre-search, I mean, that you, you bird dog this for a private equity uh, group and, and they mm -hmm. declined because it was too small. What t tell me just a little bit about the business to help the listener. Yeah. So to give an idea of their size and where they're at, at the time they had four people working all, you know, basically full time there doing mm -hmm. what came to, I think it was something like 20 ish searches a day. Okay. For, right for now, background, check, for yeah. research is background check uh, company. So they're, they're mm -hmm. manually yeah. 20, yeah. 20, 20 five, searches a day. These are pre employment searches. background checks, you know, helping yeah. people get hired. Uh, right now we do several thousand a day with 12 people. Like <laughs> the, the, the system didn't work then. And I could see mm -hmm. that it was like, okay, I know people that own businesses. Those are the people that are your clients. So I have mm -hmm. a sales in there. And I also can see like huge holes in operations here. Like so many manual things that were being done. So many processes and systems that were just, they weren't broken. They were just never built um, mm -hmm. to where I thought, okay, I'll make no money. I'll do sweat equity. I won't take a salary and I'll just see if I can build a, a working company out of this, I guess, build a job out of this. And that's kind of where I came in. Um, over time, I ended up buying that rest of the equity. That wasn't sweat. That was, I had to pay money for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, but you knew the business at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you de-risked so, that. By the time you put in cash, you'd been ha you had your hand deeply immersed in that business and knew what you could do with it if you owned all of it. So it was worth uh, the the risking exactly. your cash at that point, right? Yep. So I used kind of the last amount of what I got out of the spread effect deal to buy the buy my first partner out. There was there was three partners at the time, excluding myself. So four total. Bought one out. Later on, um, me and my partner bought the other one out because he kind of wanted to get out and stick to his other company that he is, is way bigger. And then a year and a half ago, I bought the original partner that I started working with on out of it. So now it's just me, which has its positives and negatives. Yeah, we'll talk about that. What what's uh, yeah. what, what are some of the positives and negatives? Um, there's that. Uh, John Dunn, no man's an island. Uh, it's it's hard to be an island. <laughs> uh, it is it is hard to deal with hard things alone. Mm. Uh, I recently let go of a sales guy, probably a month too late. Like not a month too late. Like it hurt anything. It's just I kind of knew a month ago that hey, this probably isn't a good idea. Until I just I didn't know who to talk to about it. I talked to Liz about it, my wife, and. Yeah. She was like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, like we have, you have to be done with that. And so it's hard not to have a business partner to talk like the really intimate details of business about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sanity check and, and yeah. accountability, accountability. Like why do we have this person that's not a fit or why, mm -hmm. you know, why are we keeping this customer that we're losing money on? These are decisions that a partner can sanity check you on and, and you're missing that now. Yep. So I, you, my, the last partner, Travis, who, uh, he, it was kind of a mutual thing. He wanted to get into, um, uh, church ministry and mm -hmm. I wanted to take over more of the business. So it was like a really good time to make that change. But I still talk to him about that stuff a lot. That's nice. Um, I've actually let go of a number of clients as part of my streamlining the business and he's helped me like, second guess like dropping certain mm. clients it's i mean it's nice to be able to drop clients like not that you want to drop clients but it's nice to be in a boat where that's allowed and so that's helped a lot yeah yeah it's super important part of 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 building a business as you say you want to you want to have a business that is sellable where you're in those meetings that you have you are on the other side of the table and you're like i want to own a business that is a yes to the people that come and shop and look and, and want to buy. Even if I don't sell, I want to own that business. To do that, you have to make a lot of hard decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I had a client that had a lot of promise of future possible revenue, but I also knew if tomorrow I sold this business and 
private equity guy, which I know a lot of them, I know what they would ask. And they would ask like, how do you service that business? So how does that work? They, I mean, they would be disgusted at how much time they took. So I was just like, why am I doing it? Like, it's my business. Who's going to stop me? So I gave him a letter and just said, hey, end of Q1, you're done. Like, I, I don't dislike you guys. I just dislike working with you. And so <laughs> um, there were some other reasons for it, too, that were helpful. But uh, anyways, yeah. All right. So so uh, the streamlining of the business is a big deal. I mean, I'll use an example for my own You know, cur current business. Uh, we do uh, one of our assets is uh, commercial landscape maintenance. Uh, our operator said, hey, these residential accounts that we acquired aren't aren't the average ticket we need to be and we run by the numbers so we need to divest these and um and so we found a great a great other business that only did residential so that we could keep good rapport and and not feed a competitor and worked out great you know but right sizing was one of those things that the, the business owners we bought from just couldn't do right they just couldn't let go it was like i've got to mm -hmm. let go of that revenue and then what then i'm going to be out of money so there's a lot of fear uh that, yeah. that you have to come in and be objective and say yeah, this is not a profitable piece of the business. No one else would keep this if they bought my business. Why am I keeping it? Yeah, I, I like to, I, I think that the, the value in doing something hard is that it's hard for someone to beat you at it if it is hard. However, if that's not, if, if that's not a benefit there, then I like to do the easy thing. I would max out on the easy stuff. Why, why build out a new funnel of like servicing a type of company we're not the best at now? Because we don't have the whole market of small hospital clinics across the U.S., just keep selling that thing we're good at selling. Um, it's easy. Build yeah. the easy, easy to service. We know what we're doing. Every question they come to us, we already know the answer. Versus, if I start servicing some, you know, say a company that hires people that draw blood, I, I mean, I don't know what it would be, but yeah. Um, if identify yeah, it as hard, I usually try to think like, well, we're not maximized on what we're good at. Why do the hard thing? Yeah. yeah. And you're building a superpower in, in the sort of uh, space where you have some authority. Right. It's not it's not just easy. It's that in some ways becomes a strength for your clients keeping you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't hard to, I mean, it wasn't easy to get into, but now that we're set in what we are, I want to keep doing what we built. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's super important. And so many businesses I've been part of, we we get a shiny new object. Uh, I, you know, it's very entrepreneurial to be like, you know, someone. This is this is where partnership can actually go go south or or help you. Got a great idea. You need someone who's like, yeah, we all we we want to listen. This is really we always will listen to great ideas, and then someone will remind us, let's shoot that down because we don't do that well. Uh, yeah, that's not not our yeah. competence. Our core competency. Yeah, I do. I definitely don't think what we do is easy. I like to think I can tell anyone pretty good details of what we do, even behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and they won't be able to just come in and do it. If it was that easy that if you just knew the ingredients, you could beat us, probably shouldn't do it. Well, I shouldn't be doing it <laughs> if it's that easy to beat. Yeah, so I love that. I, I don't think what we're doing is easy, but I do think I take the easy path now that I've kind of laid the framework for it. I like yeah. that. I think that's a good way to look at it. The you, you and I have been talking about our mutual friend and, and colleague and someone who also worked with you at uh, Spread Effect, uh, Charlie. Uh, mm -hmm. Quick commercial for, for Charlie. If anyone wants a great uh, web developer, email me. Hello at DanaRobinson.com. I will connect you to our secret weapon who is only available on a referral basis, Charles Bolger. Yeah. Um, so we got Charlie. Uh, you, you, you have deployed Charlie on a software mission for your business and and uh i, I want to call out on it because it presents a, a sort of entrepreneurial journey uh, crossroads you're gonna build software for your business and there are already a software that exists and and you know that i i want to get at the why and and whether that is always a good thing or whether it just happens to be a good thing in your space in my mind, it's always a good thing because of what I've seen, the, the automation, the system side of software, forget mm -hmm. the front end of it, but what 
having someone that's competent in solving problems with software can do is one of the biggest things I learned with working with Nate and crew is yeah. sure. We could have done everything we did with Excel spreadsheets. It would have been a nightmare and you have this really low ceiling versus there's, there's so much inside the world of what I do, you know, reporting court data is all data based, <laughs> like obviously. Uh, yeah. So to build out uh, kind of automation software that takes away as much back office stuff as you can, so you can just focus on the stuff that is, is hard. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see a way from us getting away from being, you know, a say six million ish, six to $10 million company to 50 to a hundred without solving that piece. We're mm -hmm. just going to, we have this hard ceiling of our scalability will exactly mirror our co growth and cogs. Um, if we can't take control of automation. Um, okay. I don't have all the answers for it now. That's yeah. part of like ongoing, ongoing project with Charlie of figuring out identifying what's the simple level of doing this and then growing beyond that. But I know that's at least I'm going to take the risk that that's the integral piece. I'm willing to. Yeah. Well, let, yeah. Let me, let me draw an example from my own experience. So in HVAC plumbing, uh, we use service Titan and, and it's a, a lot of friction to get it up and running, but it becomes a unified operating business operating system. Once you do all inbound calls, outbound calls, customer service, uh, everything's tied intimately into this into the system i've met hvac and plumbing owners that have bootlegged together their own software or uh you know kind of like invented ways to have quickbooks create dispatch or or something like that in in the landscape business where we are now it's uh aspire which actually got bought by service titan and and one of our port codes had a uh, custom software built in the late 80s early 90s that that they were still using until last year um, and, and in some ways they held themselves back by not just getting on the, the, the main software kind of ERP that everybody uses in your space, you're attacking the software as, a, as solving a problem that lets you scale. It must be because there isn't a SaaS yeah. that's unifying the industry in a way where you just go, everybody uses this. Yeah. And, and it's, all, it's, it's a big enough opportunity that I thought like, what about going into that space, which went back to why go after this thing that I don't do right now when I can do this? That's why I don't do it. But yeah, there's a need there. Um, I don't wholly dislike the software providers, but when everyone that gets big moves off of them, it's a good sign that it's hard to be big on them. Interesting. Um, That's a great observation. So, so oh, then you're, you're you're stuck with incumbent software providers that actually limit your growth. Yeah, and all so, and all the bigger ones get ahead of it. Yeah, and it kind of goes into that world of like I want to. I know who I am now. I I'm not a hundred million dollar background check company, but if I want to be that, I have to model myself that way. The framework of who I am has to fit that. Otherwise, when I get there, I'm going to have to constantly be breaking and building things like as soon as I identify this is where I, this is what I'll need to be there. Well, how soon can I start that? I mean, I knew this before, but I didn't have the the money yet because everything's bootstrapped. I mean, not that it has to be, but it is. Um, and so have enough money to pay Charlie. Okay, start paying yeah. Charlie. Um, and that's kind of what where it's at is I know I need to get there. I could see that's where everyone goes. So mm -hmm. do it now versus do it when I need to later. I don't need to. None of my clients are like, I need you to do this now. Right. Could I win more sales right now? Yeah. I mean, I've had, I'm fortunate enough to be able to build relationships with a few Fortune 500 and some Fortune 100 companies that have said 2025, 2026, solve these problems, we can look at maybe using you guys. None of those are easy sales. None of those are easy to close. But if I know I need to do this to be able to do that conversation in two years, I mean, two years comes up quick. So yeah, it does. Yeah. Just trying to do that. I, I mean, it also I helps love that. with immigration stuff, all that.
Yeah, well, uh, and uh, again, like the drawing from my stories, we with an audiobook business that took us over a decade to grow before we sold it to private equity. We we experimented two or three times with different directions, and and they became a distraction. The software it turns out wasn't. We had we had a great partner who was a programmer, but I think a lot of people might get into your space and then and then suddenly everything they make goes into the software. In your case, when you and I were talking about it, at one point you were you said, "Look, I'm spending a bunch of money on software. If all this does is serve my business better, then it, it accomplishes and, and costs less or the same. That it accomplishes a lot. Um, yeah. So you're yeah. not you're not using this as an opportunity to become the provider of the software, but that software might add a lot of value to an ultimate exit as well if it if it solves a problem other people have. Yeah, yeah, I see." internal software when it solves a problem that the acquirer doesn't currently have solved because most of the acquirers in my space are in my space they're they, even if they're private equity they, they may already own businesses and they're just building synergy like yeah to have software that solves something one good, like one arbitrary, I'm not building this out right now. And I think there's an opportunity. There's a couple of really large background screening companies that don't have a fingerprint solution. Fingerprint solutions are incredibly difficult to build out. You have to have physical stuff all over the nation or some network of your own built hardware to send to these places. Could you invest $50 million and build that network and then immediately turn around and try to flip it for 75? Like, I think that there's something there to that. Like, so if I can build my software to do a light version of that, something that they don't have solved yet, it, it serves the same purpose. The software creates value to them. Just it's like, oh, we can we can now use this platform and sell it to our clients that fit this. We're not doing it from mm -hmm. now. There's value there or future clients they don't have. But yeah, yeah. Try to keep that in mind as we're doing it and not just build a generic copy of everyone else um, is kind of helpful in direction and also future value. Yeah, I love that. Well, I, 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 in terms of uh, thinking of your business as an asset, uh, a lot of people have the problem that their business is a job. They're always stuck in it. I know that for you, you've got a, a business that enables you to spend a lot of time in California with, with your wife's family and with friends like me. Um, the, talk about how you how you are able to run a business and not necessarily be in the business. Yeah, what I really like about Presearch right now is I can easily spend as soon as I wake up, like Liz was out of town for a month, I would wake up and then be done. And all I would do was that. And I could easily, like none of the stuff I'm doing right now, is, like it's important, but it's not important to today. I cannot work today. I can do this call. If you said, hey, Ryan, let's do a 16 hour call. I, I would probably say no, but like I have the time. <laughs> um, it wasn't Good always enough. that way. I didn't have the time for it, say, two years ago, two years ago, I'd be like, man, if I, if I don't work for a day, I'm kind of screwed. Um, mm. I, I'm too valuable as an employee. So then it came down to like restructuring, getting the employees that I trusted to where I could do that. And that's where I'm now. If, if I needed to take a week off, I wouldn't be sweating at night wondering what they're doing. Like if, if things are going okay, if I set yeah. my email forward on, I don't double check that it's getting handled. Um, and so it's a good spot to be. Uh, but that just comes down to accepting the cost and good employees. Okay. Yeah. That, I was just going to say how, how, because this is so many people's problem. This is you can't sell the business until it doesn't need you. You can't make the money and live the life until it doesn't need you. And in two year period, you accomplished it. Like, so. Uh, yeah. So the price of employee in my town is. 14 bucks an hour. We're in Northern Wisconsin. It's not expensive. Okay. I don't pay anybody less than 20. And I'm not to say like I'm this, you know, benevolent giver of lots of money. I don't think 20 bucks an hour is a huge amount of money. I'm just saying like, that is enough that my worry with employees isn't, are they, is there, is there, is there any animosity towards me of raking in money? 
I mean, they know I make good money. I don't hide it. Like, yeah. I don't have a Ferrari, but it's not like I'm pretending to struggle. <laughs> uh, so there's a mutual respect there. I think just overall respecting employees goes a long ways. And respecting them is like a real act. Like, you can't pretend it. So if you're really doing yeah. it, it, it removes a lot of stress. There's still problems. They get mad. They get mad at me. Um, <laughs> they get mad at each other, but uh, it at least helps to keep things sort of even. When I was an employee, I always liked to think, I want to make a, just a tiny bit less than I'm worth because then they owe me. Um, having employees, I just want to pay them just a little bit more than they're worth because they owe me. Yeah. 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 Well, and I love that because I, I, I talk about, uh, again, the, the, some of these subjects just strike a, a chord for me with, with the latest book I've got, but this sort of truce or standoff between employees where they do the minimum, then I get fired and I'm going to pay you the minimum so you don't quit. And you're yeah. saying as a great employee is ambitious and says, I'll work a little harder. So you owe me. And a great employer is like, I'm going to pay you a little more. So you always owe me. So yeah. you're, you're actually raising the bar to each other. I like to joke the first time I ever meet someone, I like when they're 15 minutes late. I start off on top. You owe me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like it. There is always a balance, not like a conscious battle balance, but there's some subconscious of, you know, who's who's sorry to the other person. It's rarely equal. I don't like to right. be the person who is sorry to the other person because <laughs> it doesn't feel good to me. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, so, so you got good, good, good people. Pay them, pay them more than everybody else. So you, you've got people excited. Their morale is high. I mean, also, how do you get to the point where they are not making you do the work? Like, how, how do you train and then training. ensure that the training's there so that it's propagating itself? So it always comes down to, I like to think, if it's not my fault, then I can't control it. So I have to accept, you know, if, to, to any degree, it's like that stupid thing. Like, everyone's at fault in an accident just for driving. Um, but, uh, training is the biggest thing. Um, I recently read, and I had never read it before Ben Horowitz's book, the hard thing about hard things. He talks about it in there too. Hmm. Um, whereas if the employee's not trained, right, that means if the lowest level employee is not trained, right, then the mid-level employee didn't train them. Right. And if the mid-level employee didn't train them, right, then the higher level employee didn't train the mid-level employee. Right. And if they didn't do that, right, then I didn't train them. Right. And so it comes all the way up to me. Like I didn't make it clear enough that you have to train them. I didn't make it clear enough that these rules aren't PDFs that exist in case someone ever asks. They're, they're like real, this is our process. This is why we do things. And if we don't do these things, I don't have a good answer for a client on when something went wrong. I tell clients things will go wrong, but there'll be an answer for it. But if I don't have an answer for it, it's kind of my fault for not having these safeguards. So um, everything works better when people know what they're doing. And if they're not trained, it ultimately comes to me. I didn't have the right training for them at some hierarchy of this chain. Um, that makes things so much easier. And I lose okay, my so mind. So you, 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 yeah, two years ago, you're yeah. working hard, you're doing everything. Are you, you start creating some SOPs and some PDFs and some Loom videos. What, what do you do to start making it mm -hmm. so that you can begin to like delegate the training and, and let people begin to pick up the slack? Simple, simple beginning of like Google Drive spreadsheets and, and, uh, and Word docs to eventually now we're at a point where we're building out kind of this network of all the training we have into help juice, which is, I tried out some software. That's the one we decided to use as having like help an juice. I, I haven't heard of it. Is this like a it's, train you will? It's, a is it a okay. mm -hmm. yeah, it's just knowledge based software. It has pretty good search functions and building out new stuff. And it's kind of like just word docs essentially, but inside of a knowledge base, um, Great. And training isn't done. You don't do, you don't train a new employee. You just are always training. So I make sure that at the very minimum, we do an all ops, because I'm very much an ops person and I'm not great at sales. And the only way for me to solve them being not great at sales is to build a really good product. And then it's easy for me to sell. 
Um, I can't, I can't sell a bad product, not because I have a moral thing against it. If I could figure out a way to sell a bad product, then maybe I would, but um, <laughs> I'm not good enough at it to pitch it. Uh, so we do a, a, a weekly training. And if we don't have something specific to train on, on our weekly ops call, and it can last an hour to two hours, you know, it could go longer if we want it. It just kind of eventually it's like, we got to be done. Um, if we don't have something, we'll just say, hey, you know, Natalie, you sit there and do your job for an hour and we're just going to watch you on screen share or in person. And we might learn something or we might suggest something that we see you're doing like slower than we do it because everyone builds like their own internal tricks to getting stuff done, but they don't yeah. think to share it because it's like, well, it, that's just how we do it. I don't know why you wanted to see that. I didn't know you wanted to see how, like, I like to use link clump. Um, is like a browser add-on where you can hold down the letter Z and you drag and you you, you drag a box over a, a group of links and it opens them all in tabs. Um, okay. Simple little thing, but with the way our software works, it it can save a ton of time. It turns fifty clicks into one click. Um, wow. Just stupid little stuff that's like you don't think to share unless you're kind of shadowing someone else. So just ongoing training. I love that. Yeah. Lots so the uh, you you got this business now you got the flywheel spinning uh, it doesn't require all of your time and you and I whenever we get together start talking about other businesses that you hover around because you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for opportunity mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, you know and, and you sort of like the entrepreneurs never not interested in looking at deals uh, and you you and I a little while back talked about. Uh, a business and whether it was a, you know, good for a roll up. And so I figure in today's edition of would you do this deal? Or if you would, how would you do it? I found a biz buy sell listing. Uh, not in your neck of the woods necessarily, but a Southern Indiana building material supply store asking $2 million cash flowing $367,406. Got $4.4 million in revenue, $1.2 million in inventory. This Southern Indiana building material store sells high quality building materials. Uh, it sells hand tools, fasteners and hardware, paints and sundries, uh, automotive and sporting goods, housewares, pet and farm supplies, lumber and cold weather items. Uh, they have a uh, store that serves 5,000 customers. Uh, Talk to me about your opinion, a deal like that. You're an entrepreneur looking for uh, opportunities. What would be the things that you would, that you'd want to know, or that would go into your analysis of, of buying this yeah. uh, Indiana building material supply store? So the inventory versus asking price is pretty close. I'm curious, mm -hmm. how bad is the inventory? Like, is it just your 20 years of built up stuff that you didn't sell? Because building yeah. supply companies have big yards. And yeah. so you may not need to age out the stuff that doesn't sell. I mean, do you have a bunch of tan siding that no one puts up anymore? So like, I, I think that inventory is an interesting thing. Also yeah. the value of inventory in, in building supply. Um, are they valuing it? Like what's the number they're putting on that? Is it based off when they buy it, bought it? Cause if they bought it in the last two years, building supply, values have gone down so much like That's right not so much in a long-term average but there was a huge covid spike did you buy it during covid and do you have it on the books for that wholesale price do you have it on the books for the retail price like wh where where do you have that um that would be my biggest question of like if i like the answer to this i'll look into it and if i don't it's a quick never mind <laughs> um yeah yeah i love i like, love that i I, the thing that, that uh, the, the sizing, I mean, I know it's in a small town and so money goes a long way in a small town, but you, you got to cough up 2 million bucks for this and your cash flow, which includes the, usually an owner discretionary uh, component, $367,000. If I had $2 million, I could probably do a lot of different things that would throw off $350,000 in cash yeah. flow that might require less risk and time than owning a whole hardware store. Yeah, I think there's a huge risk. And also, if you're in a small town, Home Depot, Lowe's, those places are in every major market. 
-hmm. I don't know the answer, but I'm guessing the only expansion they're doing is in growing outside of metro areas, or at least that's got to be a component. Is there one nearby now? And is the yeah. market big enough to justify one in the future? Because if there's not one now, that's scary. If there is one now, that's okay. Because they're yeah, already dealing with that. Exactly. They're already dealing with some competition. I'm, I'm going to drive to the next town where I can get to this uh, Home Depot and, and I'm going to buy cheaper there. Or I'm going to yep. buy here local when it's quick and easy and I just need a couple of two by fours, right? So. Right. And then the 5,000 customers means, I'm curious, are they just counting people in the door? That's not contractors. I mean, they probably don't have 5,000 contractors. So my bigger question right. would be, how many contractors do you have? Because I see that as if you're good at building supply, that's where you can make your money is building a contractor relationships. Maybe they're bad at that. And that's an opportunity to come in and say, hey, I can build contractor relationships. That's my back. I mean, that's my background. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons. Not only have you and I talked about whether you, you know, yeah. we could get into a business like this, but uh, but it is your background, and you're right that that's a key customer that mm -hmm. might not be really mm -hmm. developed because with that little revenue, you don't have the salary of a biz dev person who's going to be yeah. taking yeah. contractors out golfing, right? Yeah, that realistically would be like two commercial buildings in the year like that's not a lot that's um it depending on maybe there's no commercial development there but those are interesting businesses because they're so tied into the success of the community um that's true that's true so they're sticky so there is there is the possibility that the long-standing local hardware store has yeah. loyal loyalty that outstrips and allows you some some elasticity in price so you can charge the margins you need to. Yeah. So here's one thing I thought about with those companies when I looked at them once is the town that I looked at them is not a developed town. There's a lot of houses with old roofs and old siding. <laughs> How much marketing would you have to do into, hey, move to this town to get some people with money in to need to buy your remodel supplies? <laughs> I think that... It, Small enough deals allows someone like me to actually do something on like a micro market scale to mm. build customers. Um, right. So you, you actually think you'd attract some fix and flip shops that have some capital and say, maybe work with the city and yeah. yeah, work with the city and like help fund some marketing. So I live in Northern Wisconsin in a town that is 8,000 people. We're on Lake Superior. We're surrounded by forests. There's hunting, there's fishing. There's a lot of stuff that's like, all I have to do is convince 800 people from Minneapolis and Milwaukee and Chicago to move up here and I increase population by 10%. Maybe I should just <laughs> buy some houses and go do a little marketing towards, look at the fishing and hunting you can do, raise property values and sell them. Like, yeah, you can move the needle in a small town. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, interesting. Yeah, I joke with the guys because when we moved in, Liz is Hispanic and the the average Hispanic income actually has a bump when we joined the taxes of the town of like average income because it's such a small town. There's like 10 people that are Hispanic, like small markets are kind of fun in that way. As long as your business isn't focused on it, which mine isn't. So, yeah. yeah. Love that. Well, that, that great, great observation uh, on the would you buy it? Uh, interesting deal. The mm -hmm. one thing you and I also we, we never researched this when we were talking about whether there was a f there was a few of these on the market at the time, two or three years ago. You know, what's a roll up look like is one question. You know, could you have, you know, think of people who run uh, fitness centers that make 350 uh, per branch. If they get 10 branches, now they've got critical mass, yeah. they can kind of run a simplified branch and a shared services and and maybe have an owner that's really pulling some profit out of the business at that point i don't know you you're from a small town we're talking about a small town hardware store could, could you get 10 small town hardware stores and and centralize your uh, organization I think that that's the real opportunity actually with those is because why does home depot beat them it's not because people like home depot more Home Depot simply just sells two by fours for less. And when you're remodeling your house, it often comes down to price. Mm -hmm. um, you go to the yard, maybe maybe Home Depot has more curved two by fours. You just grab the straight ones. Like, 
yeah. then Home Depot throws out the bad ones. They have massive purchasing power. So if you roll up, you start to build your own purchasing power by rolling mm -hmm. them up. And I think that that's the way that you can compete. I prefer being somebody that has a house and remodels it and stuff. I prefer to go to the small shop. I don't prefer to pay for the small shop, but there's the benefits of the small shop is I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I can ask somebody for help. You can't do that at a Home Depot. So I yeah. think there's an opportunity with building supply to build purchasing power with roll-ups while keeping them smaller local entities. Maybe a centralized warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. Centralized yeah. bird. Yeah, definitely economies of scope and, and all, all of the benefit of that. Mm -hmm. Fun. Interesting yeah. uh, times. Uh Ryan, uh, thanks for coming on the Exit Plan podcast. Uh, I, a lot of people come on here, uh, tell people how they can connect with them. Uh, you don't need any new friends, but are you on LinkedIn or uh, any uh, social platforms where people can uh, become I your, am your on, mentee? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, cool. I have a Facebook. I haven't used it in forever. I have a, I don't, I have a Twitter and an Instagram that never logged in. Uh, yeah, I have a, I have a LinkedIn. I don't, I'm pretty sure I have a LinkedIn premium one. I'm sure if you message me, I'll see it. Uh, Excellent. And then uh, the pre-search, uh, the, the uh, people looking for background check services, uh, is it presearch.com? Presearchinc.com. Presearch.com is a uh, search engine that you generate crypto tokens for. Oh. Um, and we have a mutual trademark, which somebody helped me secure <laughs> like uh, i don't know <laughs> but uh Someone anyways yeah so presearchinc.com most of the info's on the site you reach out you know you'll get somebody that'll probably forward of me and uh yeah we do background awesome. checks primarily for employment purposes we don't do them for like let me check my girlfriend that kind of thing um you hire an employee you have employees you have volunteers you run a church that kind of stuff yeah, it's a it's a bit business to business service, not a consumer service. So any business people on here looking for background checks for employees mm -hmm. and whatnot, great great service. And uh, uh, don't forget, uh, get on my newsletter at danarobinson.com and always hit me up with questions and things that I can bring to office hours in the podcast. Dana uh, Robinson .com. You you can hit us up at hello at dana robinson .com. Thanks, thanks for coming on, Ryan. Yep. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Exit Plan Podcast. I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to hit me up with questions or comments by emailing me at hello at danarobinson.com or leave comments and questions by calling 858-252-7785. Call 858-252-7785 and leave a message.